and the Greeks to the bright glow of coal miner's daughter, JFK, under siege and the fugitive. From the dark power of the executioner's song to the elegiac beauty of Lonesome Dove. That journey has taken tonight's guest to the Emmy, the Golden Globe, the Academy Award, and the respect and admiration of all of us who toil in this vineyard. Ladies and gentlemen, Tommy Lee Jones. Thirty-four guests have preceded you to this stage. Two of them, Faye Dunaway and Holly Hunter, grew up in the deep south. And each of them was convinced on this stage that she had been unalterably shaped by that fact. How important is Texas to you? Well, it's all important. It's um, my home, where I was born, where I, I, I live today. I think my... Uh, Residence is um, three miles from my birthplace, and I, I, I'm uh, personally very much attached to uh, having a sense of place, and I identify the, you know, it with the somehow with the source of my creativity. I don't believe it comes from the air. I think it comes from the dirt. <laughs> How many generations preceded you in Texas? Um, seven. I've, I've come across something that says that you are three-quarters Anglo-Irish and one-quarter Comanche. No, that's false. Is that false. romantic or, or... It's false. false. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jones, uh, obviously, is a, is a Welsh name, and right. so somewhere long ago, somebody on the maternal side, or paternal side came from Wales or thereabouts on, on my... Um, uh, mother's side, um, there's some Native Americans, but they're Cherokees, not Comanches. Close enough. Tom. No, far, far apart. There's the, the, no, but it's still it's Native American, which is, I think, a distinction. I, I mean, the Cherokees and Comanches have as much in common as Frenchmen and Chinamen. <laughs> but still, Native but they're American. but they're Native Americans. <laughs> <laughs> What was the Texas childhood like? What was the town like? Where did you grow up? Was it large, small? Small, mostly. Uh, I was born in the town of Sin Saba. Um, actually, the, probably the first person in my family to be born in a town. It's a very small town. And when I was old enough to travel, I believe we went back up to Knox County to the town of Benjamin, which may have had a 200 people in it at that time. Um, and I stayed there until it was... Um, a time to go to school, and at that point we moved to Midland. Uh, and so I, I grew up in the town of, uh, in the oil town of Midland. So it, it was mainly uh, sort of a, a ranch existence, you know, until uh, uh, we moved to Midland, and, which was a, 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 like an oil town, yeah. a boom town. Most of our guests uh, have spoken of, as children, of escaping from reality into another world. Uh, a creative life is a, a means of escape, and everybody has something to escape from. Yeah. And um, acting is very healthy, creative, hope, and one hopes constructive way of escaping. Tommy Lee's life has lots of turns in it. Uh, he went from the existence that you just heard described to a rather, I suspect, a rather exclusive prep school that would open several doors. How did that happen? Well, um, I'd been, uh, I grew up in Midland. I'd been geared to, uh, as all West Texas boys are, uh, I'd been geared to play football all of my life. Um, there was an oil uh, boom in Libya. King Idris was still in power. Gaddafi was just a cop. And um, <laughs> my, my parents went to uh, Benghazi. Uh, to, working for a big American oil company, and um, I um, 
I, I didn't want to leave Texas. And I, I certainly didn't want to miss my chance to play high school football. And um, I had a, a girlfriend I was interested in. He went to a fancy girls' school in Dallas called Hockaday. The, the boys' school not far away is called St. Mark's. So in order to keep on playing football and, and, and to chase this girl and not go to Africa, I, I talked him into sending me to, uh, to the prep school. Was it a hard adjustment for you or an easy? It was an enormous culture shock. Enormous culture shock. Uh, they, they had a, a little thing at St. Mark's called homework. <laughs> which, I, which was... I, which, you know, you weren't... Uh, um, you were supposed to be polite and, um, and you were, uh, you know, expected to read and write. And uh, those were all strange concepts uh, to me. And luckily, I, I caught on before they, they got rid of me. You even wrote poetry for their literary yeah, journal, did. You? Yeah. Was it any good? Um, yeah, it was, sort of, it was, you know, pretty good prep school poetry. So you were fitting in. And you also, at one point, had an epiphany when you walked into a rehearsal. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, tell us about that. <laughs> well, uh, they did this, at this school, they, 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 they did plays. They, had, they put on plays, and um, I remember walking, just wandering around, and um, I walked into this uh, little theater, and I walked into the back, and it was very dark, and I didn't know what the hell was going on, but it turned out they were re rehearsing Mr. Roberts. So this kid walks across the stage and this, uh, while the other kid's got the follow spot on him. <laughs> and, you know, they both have a lot of pimples. And, and this kid walks across the stage and, and, and then just falls to the floor. And I thought that was, was the strangest thing. And, and, and I hear this, uh, the headmaster was the director of plays at that time, and he, he was a fellow named Christopher Beresford, He'd, an Englishman. And, and I heard, hear this... English voice say, uh, my dear boy, you're merely drunk. You haven't been shot. <laughs> and the kid got up and scratched his head and, and he went back to the wings and came across and tried it again. And I thought, well, that's an engaging process. <laughs> uh, that you was, have to do it till you do it right. Huh? Yeah, just keep doing it till you do it right. Yeah. And, and how many different ways can you fall down? And, how can, is there a way, is there an articulation there? How did you go from St. Mark's, watch this journey now, to Harvard? Well, it, uh, you know, it had a good reputation. <laughs> <laughs> an inevitable question. We'll get it out of the way. Who was your roommate at Harvard? I had about six or seven roommates, the most famous. <laughs> The most famous one is, you know, is now the Vice President of the United States. Were there any hints then when you guys were roommates that Al Gore was headed for glory or was he just another one of the guys? No, we all pretty much thought he'd be president one day. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and didn't you also go as an athlete? Uh, well, we don't give uh, athletic scholarships. Uh, in other words, scholarships are, not, are based solely on need. You did, however, play on the football team. Yes. What, so what position did you play, Tom? Um, offensive guard. But weren't you rather small to be an offensive guard? Well, yeah, in 1968, I was the smallest starting lineman in the Ivy League, offense or defense. And uh, you, you played in an historic game. What was it called? Well, uh, in, in 1968, uh, I think Harvard and Yale met at uh, Harvard Stadium uh, to play for the um, Ivy League championship. Both teams were undefeated. I think we were behind by... 16 points with 42 seconds left in the game and we tied it up and it was a you know, thrilling thing to watch, I'm sure. It was called the tie, wasn't it? Oh yeah, the great, ever, yeah, ever the, great uh, the, the tie. The tie. Or the 29-29 victory. <laughs> uh, that, that was your farewell to football at Harvard. Wasn't that your last game? Oh, the last 42 seconds of football I played, it was quite a, it was, you know, a good way to uh, go out. It was a, a farewell to uh, anxiety. Although Tommy is very modest about it, and hasn't said a word, I will tell you that as this smallest guard in the Ivy League, he made all Ivy, the All East squads, and received an honorable mention on the Associated Press All-America list. How much did you weigh when you were doing all this on the line? Uh, 205 pounds. Jeez. Okay, once again, there were two areas of distinction uh, academically. What was your major? English. 
And uh, you wrote your uh, thesis on what subject? Uh, Flannery O'Connor. Uh, you also studied with a very famous playwright, an English teacher at Harvard, did you know? Oh, yes, we have what they call a senior tutor. If you write an honors th uh, cum laude thesis, uh, mm -hmm. you need a, a, a tutor to sort of guide you through it. And I worked closely with um, William Alfred, a uh, good friend and, and uh, a, a very fine spirit and, and a, 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 a leader, a mentor in the, in the truest sense. Your third area of interest at Harvard was theater. How much time were you able to spend on this? I think um, the first summer I, I, I went to work for an underwater construction company out of Corpus Christi. And for the remaining summers, I, I joined repertory companies. In and Cambridge? Actually, yeah, in Cambridge, and actually talked them into paying me. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. Who are the other people there at these companies? In the <laughs> very impressive, very impressive repertory companies. Johnny Lithgow, um, Jim Woods, um, St Susan Channing, now known as Stockard Channing, Catherine Walker, uh, you know, uh, Ken Tiger. Uh, a lot of, those are the, just the actors. Uh, Pretty impressive for a bunch of kids. It was also the late 60s. It was a time when revolution was in the air. It was, a it very was the best of times and, and the worst. You've described it as one of the happiest times in your life, wasn't it? Oh, very happy, yeah. It was. It was. <laughs> Must yeah. have been. Had to have been. Delighted. Uh, Harvard's football team played an interesting role in uh, smoothing Tommy's path from Cambridge to New York. There was a team doctor named Thomas Quigley. Yeah. And uh, he uh, saw some of the plays and wrote a letter. To whom did he write the letter? His daughter, Jane Alexander. He gave me a letter addressed to, to Jane, who was playing in The Great White Hope with uh, James Earl Jones at that time. And I, of course, went, you know, came to New York right away and, and knocked on the, th on the backstage door and, and said, you know, please, sir, will you <laughs> I'll give twist. this to Miss Alexander? Yeah. And, and, and she, uh, you know, allowed me to come in. And uh, a day or so later, actually took me to um, uh, her, uh, to meet, she had, she had to return a gift that she had gotten from her agent, whom she did not like. And she thought the gift was kind of cheeseoid. And <laughs> so she, she said, come, come along with me. And so I got to go with her and, and meet her agent and, and watch her abuse him roundly and I was happy to see that and, and she's very strong and you know she's teaching by you know example and and um, and that that agent actually said well you, you know okay I'll send you to meet another agent and and it was didn't take very long actually before I wound up with a, a chorus uh, contract if you I'm sure you, you all know what that is uh, uh, and play on, on Broadway. Uh, I don't want anybody's feelings to be hurt out there, but how long did it take, in fact? Ten days. <laughs> <laughs> you see, kids, there's hope. Actually, they put that in, in uh, uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Did they? Yeah, they did. You also got involved with the New York Shakespeare Festival. Oh, uh, yeah, I think I did nine, okay. 11 plays there. Uh, nine, nine plays there. In 1974, you appeared in a play that is storied. Um, and you've spoken of it as a very important period in your life. That, of course, was Ulysses in Night Town, the adaptation of James Joyce's Ulysses. What made it special for you? James Joyce uh, made it special. Right. And, and to be doing it in New York on Broadway with Zero, Mostel, made me feel like the king of the mountain, or maybe the, the attendant prince of the mountain, not the king, but somewhere way the hell up on the mountain. I felt pretty good about it. A lot, a lot of people remember Cyril Mostel's Leopold Bloom. What was it like to work with him? It was absolute magic uh, for me. I, I loved the man and couldn't take my eyes off of his work. So I would, uh, in the times when I was, wasn't, um, you know, on stage, I would be, um, I would hang out in, in, in the wings just to watch what he did. That's an education. Yes, it was. Now, back to Tommy Lee Jones inside the Actors Studio on Bravo. Now, here comes a question that we've heard before. It won't surprise very many of you, because Alec Baldwin did it, and everybody's done it. I did it. Uh, like Mark Rydell and Alec and Chris Reeve and so many of our guests, Tommy Lee Jones put in his time subsidizing himself in New York on a... 
Soap opera. Soap opera. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. one was yours? One Life to Live. Mine was The Guiding Light. Yeah. <laughs> and what was your name? Dr. Mark Toland. I was Dr. Dick Grant. Yeah. <laughs> what was that experience like? I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but was oh, it, it was wonderful. Was it uh, a learning but, yeah, it, oh, no, it was wonderful because I was able to pay rent. And, uh, and, and I could not have done those 12 or 14 plays that I did in, in the six or seven years I lived here if it had not been for, for the soap. What persuaded you to leave New York and go to Los Angeles? I kept auditioning for plays and the casting director said, we know you, we think you're a really good actor, uh, but uh, this part is, um, you know, we really need a, more of a, a, a box office name. You're not quite, the message was, you're not famous enough to get this role that we know you should have. So I said, well, I'll just go get famous and then I'll come back and get this part. But then I, once I did get famous, I couldn't afford to come back. <laughs> when you went to Los Angeles, you were immediately employed, I happen to know, in the pilot of Charlie's Angels. But equally important, in 1976, you did a, a motion picture called Jackson County Jail. Yes, a Roger, a Roger Corman road movie. Is that what drew you to it? Because a lot of people would, would like to say that they have worked with Roger Corman. Yes. Uh, well, when we were theater actors here, all, you know, all of us used to say when we were sitting in the green room, man, what I really want to do is a Roger Corman road movie with a pretty girl in a fast pickup and a big pistol running from the law. 1976 was an important year for you uh, because, of course, you followed uh, this film with a very, very good television movie. Uh, how many of you remember The Amazing Howard Hughes? Not many of you, did you see it? How did you prepare for the role of Howard Hughes? Oh, well, well, I, I had uh, every uh, magazine article and um, newspaper article and, and that had you know, been published, which is a, a room full, do you look like him? You sounded like him? I, I, I've only heard a little well, bit of him. Yeah, we did. The breathing was like him also. What do you mean the breathing? Well, when he breathed in, and if there was a record of when he breathed in, that's when I breathed in. Really? Yeah. When Faye Dunaway was here, we talked about the eyes of Laura Mars. And I hear a sigh. You're right. What Tommy does in that film is fool you. You had a good secret. You kept that secret. And then when you revealed it, it was a wonderful scene in which you finally confessed to her and tell her the truth. It's a very frightening scene, and you do a 180 degree turn on her. Um, and um, I have heard that you... It's a literal you, 180 degree turn. Literal. Yeah, because right. the, the film is projected uh, in reverse. Is it really? Yeah, it's a multiple personality. So... Uh, you know, they flipped it? They flipped it, yeah. So you're looking at it right to left. When the, uh, you know, when the evil guy comes out. Oh my God. The, the bad personality. Uh, and, but I've also heard that you wrote that whole long confession. Did you? Yes, I did. Well, I, now the truth can be told. <laughs> but uh, I kind of had to uh, write it. Uh, well, what I did, I had a, you know, a guy that I played football with in uh, prep school uh, was a shrink here in New York City at the time. And I uh, said, well, we, you know, we're in trouble here with this script, and I'm interested in multiple personalities. What can you tell me about it? And he gave me a reading list. I read the book. We walked around the park, talked about what makes people's personalities split. And um, so I said, okay, well, you know, thanks. And I, I, uh, then I went to Kirsten. I said, how long does this speech need to be? He said, you know, three quarters of a page. And um, a couple of days later, I had... Uh, um, written something that was appropriate to the script as it had been done up to that point and, and was scientifically correct. And uh, so I, I went to Kersey's apartment in the dead of night and said, here, you wrote this, didn't you? And he said, yes, I did. And I said, well, <laughs> excuse me. And off I went. <laughs> the interesting thing about Tommy is that no matter what movie his, he's in, uh, Tommy has a rare quality. He makes Tommy makes movies well, he's a good actor, and he makes movies good. Doesn't necessarily have to be a good movie, but when Tommy's finished with it, it's usually pretty good to very good to exceptional. I'm going to talk now about a movie I love for a whole lot of reasons, and it's called Coal Miner's Daughter. <laughs> um, 
some of you know that one of the reasons that it means so much to me is that four times in my life I worked with Loretta Lynn and Mooney. I've spent weeks in Nashville, weeks in their home in Hurricane Mills. I know them both well. They are my family, and I love them beyond description. Um, I know Mooney, who has recently died, and Tommy has a way of getting inside Howard Hughes or Gary Gilmore, as you'll see, or Mooney Lynn, that is unlike the ability of any actor that I can name to you at this moment. Um, it's uncanny. How well did you know that? Did you get to know the two of them? Oh, very well. They're, you know, as, as you know, they're uh, accessible people. Sure are. We, we won't speak of Mooney in the, in the past sense. We, Can't. Um, but so they, um, and, and you know, very country. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by that, do you mean what I mean when I say they're very country? I've worked with many, many, many country music people. They are just plain the nicest people in show business. They're just awful nice. I mean, they, they gave me, uh, you know, they reach in their shoebox of, of uh, family photographs yeah. and say, here, take these with you if you're going to play Oliver Van Etta Lynn. And he told me uh, stories about his relationship with his father, things that happened in his childhood, uh, things that he had done as a young man. And, uh, and I, you know, sat with them for... Um, uh, a long time. He showed me how to drive a bulldozer. I got uh, on that thing too. I got on it too. And um, it was, uh, you know, a, a, a beautiful working uh, experience for me. Because up until that time, uh, I think the audiences in America had their their, their experience of uh, so-called country people was pretty pretty much limited to Ma and Paul Kettle, mm -hmm. or to the Beverly Hillbillies. Uh, and, and so a chance, uh, with my background, um, a chance to you know, uh, work on a large scale and, and represent uh, my people, or what I think of as my people, or my culture, or a culture I have an affinity for in some realistic way, to erode that stereotype somehow was a, was a privilege, and, I, and, and a high calling, I thought. What was it like working with Sissy Spacek in it? Well, I mean, this, that's a woman that I really love. Yeah. Um, if I had a, I'm an only child, and if I had a, if I could choose a sister, I would pick her, of course. Um, and uh, it's uh, heavenly. Um, it's very comfortable. Yeah. It's um, e efficient, fast moving, thorough, uh, articulate, deep, <coughs> and wide. There are several unforgettable scenes in the film. One is that the morning after you've deflowered this 14-year-old girl. Get you all ready. Well, hell, I'm sorry, Loretta, but you drove me to it. For this film, uh, Tommy Lee was nominated for a Golden Globe Award and uh, he was also nominated for a New York Film Critics Award. Now remember, this is a guy who's really sort of still beginning. Um, in 1982, there was a television motion picture called The Executioner's Song. Uh, what another sigh and a deserved one. That was an extraordinary film, and what a performance. What drew you to the role of Gary Gilmore in The Executioner's Song? What uh, Norman Mailer's uh, screen teleplay did. Uh, you know, the, the book was uh, famous. Norman had, had been very important to us in the 60s. We, uh, around Cambridge, we were always reading all of his books and um, talking about his ideas. Uh, and uh, as we still do, um, somebody I, I, who's, I, I cannot remember had written one teleplay. And it really wasn't very good. And this producer... Uh, Larry Schiller said, well, uh, we'll just have Norman do it. And, and uh, he, he came up with this brilliant uh, uh, teleplay. Uh, I don't know. I suppose he just sprang from the earth a full-grown <laughs> screenwriter. Not quite. Uh, he learned his trade at the Actors Studio, where he's been a member for, I think, something like 37, 38 years. And Norman was, as our students may know, was one of the creators of this master's degree program, uh, taught by the Actors Studio here at the new school. If so if you have any complaints, speak to him. As a matter of fact, tell him now. Norman, stand up and say hello.
The, attra the attractive thing about the, uh, the job was that uh, Norman had written this brilliant teleplay and, and I've always had the idea, I may be off base, but it, it, it seemed to be um, an American uh, crime and punishment. Yeah. Uh, capital punishment was an issue. Uh, the quality of life in the prisons was an issue, as it continues to be, but yeah. it, it was a prominent issue then. And, to, to deal with these issues in a dramatic context with this safety net and underneath in the um, umbrella above of, of a mind like uh, Norman's put us in good company. You were in good company. We're in good company tonight, by the way. It was <coughs> Norman and his wife, Norris Church, who uh, pulled me into the actor's studio a few years ago. And Norris played in a scene with you in yeah. that motion picture, and I Quite would like well. to acknowledge Norris. Would you stand up, please? Yeah. <laughs> There's a whole lot of Harvard in that front row. Um, how did you prepare Gary Gilmore, that role? Well, it was different than, uh, uh, than uh, uh, Hughes, for example. I mean, I didn't really look much like Gary. And it was somehow more important to be a Gary Gilmore, not the Gary Gilmore. We empathized at moments with him. Was that part of your plan? I think it was part of Norman's plan uh, so, uh, that we empathize with him, that we be tempted to empathize with him, that we really understand how difficult these issues are. And um, I mean, the, the, you could argue a, uh, in Gary's behalf and say he's a product of the prison system. Mm -hmm. We've made this person. We created him as a society. Mm -hmm. um, it is our responsibility to cure him. That's an argument. Do you think he should have been executed? I don't think we killed him soon enough. Really? And I, I know it's pretty tough, but the fact is that which we call a civilized society is a very fragile and delicate thing. It can be destroyed, it can be torn up, it can be menaced, it can be polluted easily um, at any moment. It's delicate. For the role of Gary Gilmore, Tommy Lee won the Emmy for the best performance of 1983. Now, back to Tommy Lee Jones inside the Actors Studio on Bravo. Let's talk about Lonesome Dove. Um, what drew you to it? Uh, Larry's book. I, that, it's Larry's best work. And it's kind of sort of his, I would call it his magnum opus. <laughs> the book is made up of, um, sort of rumors, legends, jokes, stories, history, all of it uh, 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 deriving from a, a place that's very, you know, uh, close to me and, and to my... Uh, family and insofar as creativity does derive from a place this was an ideal uh, job for a, a, a guy like me you've said that you made this one for your children well in a, in a way I, I, I want I, everyone who worked on the movie really cared about it a great deal and I, I cared about it deeply and I wanted my children to be able to uh, look at it uh, as in, in, the, in years to come uh, and and be proud of it it's important to me yes this was home to you both geographically and emotionally very much so is Captain Call, a, he strikes me as being one of your most deeply layered roles with a lot of things going on at once. And um, uh, here you were playing a, a man whose feelings are by definition repressed. Uh, did you build him out of a number of people or did you find him in yourself? How did you create Oh, that? I tried to build him the same way Larry McMurtry did. The, the model, I think, is uh, a, 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 an important man uh, named, uh, named Charlie Goodnight. The inventor of the cattle drive. Right. Um, so I read J. Everett uh, Haley's uh, book on Charlie Goodnight, and, and then um, I filled in the gaps or fleshed the character out with uh, people that I know. A lot of people. A lot of people that I know. Would you take one one element from one person, and one element from another, and a hand gesture here, an attitude there, and 
put them all together if we're good and, and, and come up with a complete human being that serves a narrative. That's the whole point. There are a couple of scenes, of course, that are unforgettable in which you play. One is the scene when Gus reproves you for your behavior toward the mother of your child and toward your child. Oh, yeah. And asks you to bury him in, a, in this place. Yeah. When you were riding away, I wanted to see you through those trees, but they kept getting in the way as the two of you rode away. I did, too. And I really got mad at the editor because that scene was uh, shot in many different uh, angles, and they, they, they chose a tracking shot looking through the weeds. It was just a bad choice. I, I, I mean, I, I'll get over it one of these, you know, <laughs> one of these days. You haven't yet. I, I, I know, but that, that tracking shot through the, through the branches was... <laughs> Was, was not, there were, there were better alternatives. There's another scene in it that we did see fully, fully. And that is a scene in which Gus dies. And once again, you convey everything with almost, in 1991, Tommy made a film called JFK. And once again, you spun 180 degrees. Here was a flamboyant, homosexual businessman, um, who was certainly unlike anything that you'd played before. How did you play Clay Shaw? Rather than try to play the Clay Shaw, the idea was to play Jim Garrison's Clay Shaw That's and Oliver Stone's Clay Shaw. That, it's important. Um, so the first thing I did was um, interview Jim. Uh, the first thing he told me was, I can tell you more about Clay Shaw than Clay Shaw's mother ever could. Uh, so I said, okay, I sure would like to hear it. And then I found a person who um, worked with and for Clay Shaw, who uh, w was a, a similar character. Uh, and, uh, and people had told me this man had an accent just like Clay's, and, but he was on his deathbed. And so I found his son, and his son volunteered to go interview his dad about Clay. And I'd been told that he sounded like him, uh, and, and that was very informative, and it was on this tape that I, I, I learned about the, uh, his having gotten himself up as the, um, as the winged Mercury, one Mardi Gras. And uh, I went running with the tape in hand to Oliver, and I said, I, I gotta paint myself gold, man. And he said, um, what are you talking about? You know, and, and I played the tape for him, and he said, all right, get, you know, and I said, I, I, I need some pigeon wings for my, for my feet. And a, you know, and, a, and a World War I uh, combat helmet right. with some parrot wings and coming, you know, and I had a little, he said, you got it, fine, get out of here. <laughs> and uh, so that, that wound up going. In that film? No. None. How do you feel about improvisation? I'm a child of the theater, a child of literature, and uh, I just don't believe in improvisation. Do you like rehearsal? Yes, I do. And the more of it, the better. I think, I, I believe in rehearsal. Um, I, I think you can, look, you can say, you can create a structure, you can create it within the context of a single scene. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And maybe halfway through the part where it ends, you can say, okay, we'll get up to this point, and then maybe some, something will happen here. We'll, uh, we'll plan an accident here. Right. Uh, but we know pretty much what that accident is going to be. Tommy Lee was on screen for fewer than 20 minutes out of the 188 minutes that the film ran. But he received glowing reviews and an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actor. But I think the most telling tribute that he received for that film came from Norman Mailer, who, despite his involvement with Tommy Lee in the Executioner's Song, when he saw this movie, turned to somebody and said to them, what's the name of that marvelous actor playing Clay Shaw? <laughs> True? You fooled him. You worked three times with each of two directors, Oliver Stone and Andrew Davis. Obviously, it was satisfactory to them. Um, I'd like to discuss two of the movies that you made with Andrew Davis. I'll discuss them very briefly because in each case, you took a role that could have been a cliche, or at best, a pencil sketch, and turned it into a complex and interesting portrait. Let's talk first about, of all things, Under Siege. Most of that movie was written um, in the trailer, uh, you know, really? uh, while the cameras were being put up that day. So you'd pretty much write the day's work uh, in the trailer that, and then go shoot it. The names Stranix and Commander Krill 
are kind of a clue to that this isn't, this isn't Hamlet. Uh, and you and Gary Busey seem at moments to be doing a, a, a hilarious vaudeville turn. Yeah, a little bit, and also to, you know, do, to make action, adventure, uh, hostage movie, we had, you know, to actually, to, you know, to hold up, present, and put a hard sell on every cliche in the, in the book, and, and while laboring to make it somehow new and different and interesting was the, uh, was the assignment. And uh, so we, we, we took it on, you know, happily. I'm going to give Andy Davis, the director, the last word on Tommy Lee Jones. He says, Tommy Lee has got an incredible presence and great power. And it comes off the screen, it jumps at you. If you have him do a scene nine times, it'll be different each time, every take usable. Do you vary much from take to take? Do you feel free to vary from take to take? Or do you try to match? It depends on what I'm asked to do. Um, some directors uh, would, would like you to offer different renditions. They'll say, okay, we got that one, now do the slow version. Some say, oh, look, this is what I want, we're going to do it until we do it right. Uh, really, your job is to uh, serve the director. Now, back to Tommy Lee Jones inside the Actors Studio on Bravo. In 1993, fortunately for all of us, you stuck with Andrew Davis, and he stuck with you, to create a definitive motion picture thriller. And you also created the most relentless and compelling pursuer of, and pursued since Javert and Jean Valjean. How did the role in The Fugitive come to you, please? Well, by that time, Andy and I had, uh, you know, done two movies together, and we were good friends. I knew his family uh, very well, and uh, he, uh, you know, came to me, his friend, to see if I, you know, if I was available. I said, I'd, you know, I'd be happy to go to work. How did you prepare Marshal Gerard? Well, I spent a little bit of time with uh, some U.S. Marshals, uh, not, not a lot. Uh, I just studied the, uh, the script very carefully and uh, paid very close attention to Harrison. <laughs> Uh, you know, if you're going to be in, in a movie with Harrison Ford, you need to, you know, pay attention to it. So I, um, you know, b put my mind to, you know, the question of how, how can I serve not only the director, but what can I do to make Harrison's job easier and, and better? One of the ways that you made it better was by creating an antagonist who was capable of dealing with Richard Kimball, for whom we felt enormous sympathy. Um, yeah, the movie wouldn't have worked if we didn't really care so much about uh, Harrison. The first opening moments when we see his wife get killed and, and, and then we continue to flash back to it throughout the movie, or, or really, that's a driving um, engine. It's the driving engine until Gerard appears on the scene. And then you have one of the best first lines in the last decade of movie making. When we've just seen the bus turn over and we've seen Harrison Ford running from the out of the bus and running from the train, and the train has nearly crushed him, and one of the most extraordinary effects in the history of motion pictures, and you come on the scene, and we wait to hear who is this guy, how will he behave, what will he say, and what is your first line? My, 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 what a mess. <laughs> and you know that the picture is in good hands. <laughs> there are a number of famous moments in the film not least of which is another of the lines that I believe you wrote. When you trap Richard Kimball. <laughs> I see a student doing this to me. <laughs> when you trap Richard Kimball in the tunnel and he says, I'm an innocent man, and what do you say? I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Why? You wrote that line. Why did you say that? Uh, in my conversations with the uh, with, with the United States Marshals, uh, it was um, that's what I learned about them. They, they they're amused often, and that's what I found interesting. They're often amused by these fugitives they chase. They don't really care if you're guilty or innocent. Um, if you're loose and you're supposed to be caught, that's what they care about. Tommy Lee won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for that role against competition like Rafe Fiennes in Schindler's List. He also won the L.A. Film Critics Award and a Golden Globe Award as Best Actor of the Year, which he was. You made a very unusual Oscar acceptance speech for a very unusual reason. What was it you told them? Because you were shooting Cobb at the time. Oh, yeah, I was playing Tyrus Raymond Cobb, which required a wig, and, 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 they, uh, and to wear that wig, they had to shave my head. 
So I, be I believe I, I told the audience that I, that I was not really bald. With natural born killers, we enter another realm. <laughs> it's also the minefield of satire. It was meant as satire, though sometimes it's hard to believe when one watches the movie. How did the fact that you were playing in satire affect uh, your approach to this film and to the character of Warden McCluskey? I, I, I tried to make this as you know, revolting a character as I possibly could, but I think that's what uh, Oliver had in mind. So when the hairstylist said, what do you want your hair to look like? I, I, I said, well, uh, I, I think uh, it should look like a 57 Studebaker. <laughs> With, with long um, <laughs> Carl Perkins sideburns and a little uh, pencil-thin toothbrush mustache and lots of plaid polyester. For those who haven't seen this movie, tell them what happens to you at the end. Oh, he, he's a... a th this, this performance was criticized quite rightly as being over the top, but I, I thought that was the whole point. I thought it was. Just go over the top and then keep going. Um, <laughs> Whatever, whatever, uh, whatever the result might be, uh, he's a, a warden in a prison, a, a ridiculous uh, egotist and bigot who uh, winds up being torn to shreds by the inmates in his in his prison. He's beheaded. Beheaded, uh, yeah. The last film I'm going to deal with tonight is a new departure for Tommy Lee. No surprise, all of his films have been new departures, and this time he became director, co-writer and star as well. It's a very, very good movie and it's called The Good Old Boys. Thank you. Um, what made you decide to undertake three disciplines in one film? Uh, greed for create, creative control. <laughs> Who brought this to you? Uh, this book was, uh, is written by uh, a fellow named Elmer Kelton who uh, was a, uh, a writer for an agricultural publication called the Livestock Weekly. It was published out of uh, San Angelo, Texas. It's a wonderful publication. And he wrote uh, novels on, on the side, Western novels, and uh, was kind of a third level uh, regional novelist. Uh, but he, he has written three books that have gotten some critical acclaim. Mm -hmm. The Good Old Boys is one of them. It was sent to me by uh, Edgar Sherrick, a Harvard man. A Dunster House guy. Uh, so uh, Edgar sent me this and said, uh, if you like this, we'll try to set it up somewhere. I read it and I, th I just loved it. And he, he then began to go through the television producers, uh, standard steps. Okay, here's a list of 20 writers. Uh, read some of their work. We'll interview them. And, we'll, and I said, look, well, while we're doing all of this, uh, I'll just write an outline or a treatment, okay? And he said, okay, you can go ahead and pretend to write a treatment. Well. Um, I, so I would work on these movies uh, and, and go to the motel, hotel, and wherever, whatever town it was in. And after uh, you know, like a hundred days of that, I had a screenplay, and they hadn't picked their writer yet. So I said, "Look, this is what I want to shoot." And they looked at it and said, "Damn, who wrote that?" I said, "I did." And and uh, uh, and I said, "You can have it really cheap." <laughs> and, <coughs> so because I. It was important to me that, uh, that, you know, that I, what I wanted to do with this movie, uh, look, I worked for five cents on a dollar to make that movie. Uh, that's how I got the job of director. I had mm -hmm. to deliver them an expensive actor cheaply. Right. Um, well, I called my friends up and begged them to come work cheap. Sissy Spacek, Sam Shepard. Yeah. You surrounded yourself with With friends. my friend, Richard and Karen Jones, lots of right. people that are uh, family and friends. So they, uh, as the director, I did not mistrust them. I did not have any reason to manipulate them. They had nothing to fear from me. The last question I want to ask you is about something dear to my heart. I know that you have a passion for polo. Talk to me just for a minute about that. Please. About polo? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's my athletic life. Uh, it's always been an important part of my creative life. Uh, you know, uh, uh, having a, some kind of uh, interesting and physical life is, is good for actors, I think. And uh, I get bored with uh, tennis. Uh, when I was a kid, golf was always, always a, a rich man's game. It was never accessible to me. And I hate jogging and... Um, but I, I love horses, and we raise horses. Um, you raise polo ponies? Yeah, we uh, raise, train, and sell uh, polo horses uh, on our ranch. 
And we've done awfully good with them this year. No, I mean you as a, as a polo player. What? As a polo player, are you good? Yeah, I'm good. Of course, yes, I am good. And, <laughs> and once a year, doesn't a certain team come uh, and use your facilities? Oh, yes, yeah, so you talk about the Harvard kids. They, yeah. they come uh, on, I think, three different occasions. Um, we spend about a week. I provide the horses. And, uh, we've done that on three different occasions. Um, I play, you know, I've been playing polo a long time, and I, I really do think it's the finest thing that a, a man and a horse can do together. Except jumping, jumping over some fences, I, I would argue with you. Jumping them over fences is just as much fun, and just, yeah. as, well, just I, as good for the horse and just as good for the person. I, I, I admire the thoroughbred horse, uh, probably the, the finest athlete among mammals, I think. Yeah. Tommy Lee Jones inside the Actors Studio on Bravo. We end each of our evenings with the questionnaire which is invented by Bernard Pivot on Bouillon de Culture. And uh, it's uh, a matter of tribute for me to Pivot to ask these questions. He's the best at the talk shows. Um, what's your favorite word? My favorite word. Oh, this is a bit like an acting game, and it's really good for people to do this. So. <laughs> it is. I must say, I'm very glad you feel that way about no, it. No, not really. <laughs> I, um, my favorite, I mean, I'll say, what would my favorite word be? I think it would be honor, because it is such a, a big and useful word. Not that I, I know what it means, but I, I do know that uh, when, when people can agree on its meaning, that love is often the result. When people disagree, the result can be war. But it's a... A, a, a nice, uh, big, and effective dynamo of a word. I'll take it. Your least favorite word. Cute. <laughs> Nobody's ever said that one before. <laughs> What turns you on, excites you, inspires you, personally, creative, spiritually, anything? A really good horse. Yeah. Inclined to agree with you. What turns you off? A trend, a fad, something hip or chic. What is the sound or noise that you love? Children playing. What's the sound or noise that you hate? Leaf blowers. <laughs> you, can tell he's, you can tell he's a Harvard man, can't you? <laughs> I wonder if you'll be able to tell now. What's your favorite curse word? Sons of bitches. <laughs> what profession other than yours would you like to attempt? You know, maybe teaching school. Coaching football. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to be a football coach. What profession would you not like to participate in? I don't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> or a, I really don't. And finally, <laughs> if heaven exists, yeah. what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Come on in, son. You did fine. <laughs> I would like to, I'd just like you to take note of this, it breaks our record, and the reason is that we have seldom had anyone up here who is quite as interesting as Tommy Lee Jones. He's an amazing person, he's taken us on a great journey tonight, would you help me thank him for that? Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. Can you leave a question and answer? Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ajala Perkins, and I'm on the directing track first year. And I was wondering, I know Norman Jewison 
And um, Mark Rodell, they talked a little bit about actors testing directors. And I know you talked about your relationship with directors. And I was wondering, have you ever tested directors? And if so, how? <laughs> and no, what the outcome was? I don't uh, test uh, directors. I find I'm, I'm very comfortable um, with my understanding of the actor's job as the director's uh, servant. Um, my, what I tell directors is, um, Listen, boss, if you can say it, you can see it. Just think it up. If you, get, if you got the brains to think it up, I, 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 you'll, I'll do it. As a director, that's what I expect of actors, and that's when I've seen the, the, the best uh, results. I come to directors with a uh, hundred ideas a day, uh, knowing that only two or three are required. But, and if, but you, your job is to give the director options. I, I don't challenge or, or test a director. I want them to feel comfortable. I want them to look upon me as a solution rather than a problem. Hello, my name is Nick and I'm a writer. Please correct my memory if it's a bit faulty, but did you not uh, star in a version of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof with Jessica Lange? Yes, I did. Okay. I didn't star in it, I just played Brick. Well, I'd consider that a star role. Well, Jesse was a star. I mean, look, that, that, it had Kim Stanley in it. It had Rip Torn also. I bring this up because I've seen more than a few actors in this program working on Brick and Maggie. Yeah. Can you give us what's the secret to Brick, what's the roadblock, what did you go through with that guy? That's a very good question. Uh, there's, I, I don't remember the, uh, the critic's name, but there's a good essay on that subject. And, uh, and Williams himself wrote about it. I believe that this is his best play. I believe it may be his only really finally good play. Uh, Brick is a very uh, interesting, very character to me. And I think that Tennessee was thinking, of, uh, I believe that Tennessee was thinking about Nietzsche and nihilism. And I believe if we were to think about Tennessee's reading of Nietzsche, we might uh, be well on the road to answering your question. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Eileen Chang, and I'm an actor. Um, I enjoyed your performance in Heaven and Earth very much. Thank you. And I just wanted to ask you if you could just elaborate on working on that, and if you liked it. Yeah. Oh, I loved it. It just changed the world for me. Uh, I remember sitting on an airplane and flying and flying and flying and flying, to, and uh, then uh, winding up in this hotel, and, s and then sleeping that I'd left LA and I got up in the morning and I opened up those curtains and my god there was Hong Kong Harbor and I, I said man you're on the other side of the world this is and I, it's kind of hard to catch my breath those little boats are bobbing around there and we went on over to Thailand and and, it, and my mind was changed uh, entirely um, by the experience um, being s so close to, well, being in Southeast Asia. Uh, th th that war is very important to my, my generation. Um, yours, to everybody's generation. Um, and to be so close to the, uh, to, the to have that uh, correlative there, be able to touch these things rather than just think about them, uh, and be you know, part of Oliver's story and follow him around as he recreated his, his experience and um, Lely Hayslip's experience was um, really something. And um, I don't know, Thailand was um, a real eye-opener for me to live closely with people who know things uh, that, as a society that we do not know and to learn from them. Hi, Mr. Jones. Yes. My name is Siobhan Reynolds. Yeah. Um, you spoke about a football game at, at Harvard. Yeah. And you said that it was an opportunity to bid a farewell to anxiety. And I was just wondering what you meant by that and if you would elaborate on that. Well, sure. I, um, I, I suppose that there, was, uh, there was a freedom. Uh, in that game, uh, I'd, I'd been worried about what would happen if I couldn't, if I didn't have football in my life anymore, and so, and so I prepared myself and 
uh, that was a, a really chaotic day. There were people were screaming and yelling. I think two guys died in the stands. The old, old, an old blue and an old crimson had fell over dead from heart attacks. Um, and uh, the people were screaming and yelling. And and um, I don't know if the term uh, epiphany is appropriate, but I I, I I do remember an objectivity. Uh, that came upon me that I, that I was grateful for. Uh, it, the, the same thing has happened um, in the theater from time to time and on, and on other playing fields. Um, there's, a, a, there's a freedom in, a, in the creative life uh, that was very much present on that day. That this, uh, an objectivity, I suppose it is. Uh, a perspective. Uh, and, and the kind of thing that I think a good oil painter must or must know that good musicians are good the people with creative lives it certainly made the sky look blue and the grass look green <laughs> <laughs>